So where we introduce communication systems, very simple concepts in the first lecture. What is a communication system? What uh, that we want to get information from one point to another. That's communication. And now we're trying to characterize how could we measure how good a communication system works. So our aim is to get information from one location to another, data communications. What we looked at towards the end of the le previous lecture was different types of information. Quite simply, we looked at some examples of Okay, how big is a web page? How big is a song or a, a movie? And we did a few calculations to finish to, to give an idea of typical sizes of information we want to transfer. Towards the end of this topic, we'll try and say, well, if we want to transfer a movie, a photo, a web page from one entity, one entity to another, what does the user require in terms of performance? That's what we'll get to at the end of this topic. Which one was biggest? Those that were here last lecture of those examples, which one was the biggest? Anyone remember? The movie, we did some calculations of an example movie and it turned out that the movie, a two hour movie was about 10 gigabytes. Nine gigabytes of actually video, one and a half gigabytes of audio. Let's keep going. Sometimes the types of information we we group together. Sometimes we talk about audio, voice calls, radio streaming as example, other times video, which usually includes audio. Someone talks about a video application, it usually means the, the, uh, the picture as well as the audio. So video conferencing, video streams, and other applications or other information types sometimes just referred to as data. Data is a bit confusing. Sometimes data, the word refers to all or any type of information. Other times it refers to specific non-audio, non-video types. We'll try and avoid that confusion. But there are many applications uh, in the data classification. What we want to get to, we'll start with today is how do, how do we know if a communication system is good or effective? And the three basic measures are delivery, accuracy, and timeliness. Okay? A good or an effective communication system will have all three of these. As we go through the topic today, we'll see some more details of each of them, especially the last two. They're quite simple. Delivery means that the data that we send from one point to another should get to the correct destination. Remember, we want to get information from A to B. A sends the data, our communication system, whether it's a single link or the entire internet, should get that data to the correct destination, B in this case. That's almost obvious, that case. Accuracy is to say that if A sends data to B, assuming it's delivered to B, that the data that is received by B is an accurate representation of what A sent. A has some data to send to B, they send it, what B receives should be the same or more generally an accurate representation. We'll look, look in some cases it doesn't have to be identical. Okay, so some measure of accuracy. Timeliness is that A sends data to B, A sends the data now, B should receive that within some reasonable time. It shouldn't be delayed too much. And we'll talk about how much is too much as we go through these slides. An example. You need to submit an assignment tomorrow for this course. Deadline is 5 p.m. tomorrow. And you need to email it to me. Okay, I'm getting old and I mainly use email for communications. So you need to email me the assignment uh, by 5 p.m. tomorrow. If you don't email by the deadline, then you get zero for the assignment. So, tomorrow you do the assignment. Don't worry, this is just an example. There's no assignment. <laughs> tomorrow you do the assignment and you uh, re finished. You've got the answer and you're typing up the email and send me the email. Okay, so in the, 
when you compose the email, you say to address to steve at sit.tuac.th. That's my email address. And you type in the, the message and the answer. And you press send. Now, delivery is saying, well, what happens if when you press send, for some reason, that email message goes to Dr. Tanarak? It goes to his email box, but not mine. What's your problem? You get zero for your assignment, your problem is, because I don't receive the assignment by the deadline, therefore, uh, this has been ineffective communications. The communications is sending me an email, but if for some reason the system delivers the email to someone else, that's ineffective communications. That's all. Why would it deliver to someone else? Maybe there's an error in the setup of, of one part of the communication system. So that's delivery. If we send to some destination, it must be delivered to that destination. Otherwise, it's ineffective. Accuracy. You compose the email. And in the email, you must include the answer for the assignment. And you type in the nice email, here's my answer to the assignment. The answer is 42. That's the answer. And you press send. And you send the email. And it's delivered across the internet. It arrives at my email inbox. And the text says, here's the answer. The answer is 43. The received message is different from the sent message. Again, you fail because you gave me the wrong answer. So if for some reason the data received is different from what was sent, because of usually a failure in the communication system, then it's ineffective communications. So accuracy is making sure that what's received is accurate from the receiver's perspective. Sometimes it needs to be identical. In the case of the email, it should be identical. If you compose an email and press send, the email I receive should be identical to what you typed in. If not, well, it's not a very good email delivery system. But in some cases, we'll see it doesn't have to be 100%. Timeliness, you send the email tomorrow at 4 p.m. The deadline's 5 p.m. The internet delays this email and it arrives in my email inbox at 6 p.m. You get zero again. Okay, so. The communication system must deliver the data in a timely manner, in, within reasonable time. What's reasonable for an email? Anyone? From when you press send until when someone receives the email, what do you think is a reasonable time? How long should they wait? Uh, yeah, it depends on size, but how long would you wait? Yeah? Two seconds, a few seconds maybe? Okay. Maybe an easier one. Let's say you're using some instant messaging application. Old days, MSN, Line or similar, where you type a message, press enter, the other person sees it and they immediately respond. Or well, immediately... What's the time? What's reasonable time? from when you press enter until when the other person receives the message? At most 10 seconds. At most 10 seconds. Okay. What if it was one hour? You're using line, you press enter, and they receive it one hour later. Ineffective communications. One second? Okay. Milliseconds? Okay. So different applications will have different requirements of what timeliness is good. Similar, what accuracy is good? Towards the end of these slides, we'll give some more examples of them. So that general measures of what is effective data communications. We're going to have some more specific measures in a moment. But before that, what, have, what is this? Again, sometimes applications that transfer information are classified by different names or different groups. In terms of the internet, applications we use in the internet, sometimes we refer to traditional or normal internet-based applications and, and other types being multimedia or real-time applications. Some examples, internet-based file downloads, email, web browsing, instant messaging, 
or sometimes remote logging, connect to another computer, databases. In these types of applications, accuracy is usually most important. Again, you, s you type in an email, you press send, the data received should be identical to what was sent. Accuracy should be 100%. You visit a website which is really downloading a web page from a server to your browser. The web page that your browser gets should be the same as what was on the server. The accuracy should be 100%. With multimedia or real-time applications like audio or video streaming, watching YouTube, maybe more so interactive applications like voice or video calls, Skype or similar, gaming, collaborative desktop sharing applications. In those applications, timeliness is usually more important. You are talking using Skype or similar, using your computer or phone. From when you say something on your device until when the other person receives the audio representing what you said, the delay should be quite small. Otherwise, if the delay is in the order of a few seconds, you speak and then there's a delay before they receive it and while they're waiting for to receive and hear you speak, they start speaking and you start to overlap in your talking. And most studies show that delays in the order of several hundred milliseconds is usually desired. Gaming, if you play online games, you multiplayer games. For example, you see the screen where you see other players which are nearby. And you press the button to shoot someone else. Then from their perspective, the other player, they should get feedback of what happened almost immediately. If there's a large delay from when you do something until when they see something, the game will not work very well. People talk about a lag in the, in the game. That's too much delay or not timeless, timeliness delivery. Email, web browsing can usually tolerate more delay or less timeliness delivery than these applications, whereas these applications, and we'll get to it later, can tolerate some less or lower accuracy. When you're streaming a video, you're watching a video on YouTube, there's a video on the YouTube web server, and they send it to you, to your browser, and the browser displays the video. If you don't receive 100% of the video, you can still play it back and watch the video. What may happen is that you start to see some small artifacts in the, in the video on your screen. That is, you're watching the video, it's uh, high resolution, high quality, but some of the data doesn't get received by your browser. Most video formats and players are smart enough to uh, handle uh, less than 100% accuracy of the data delivery. That is, um, imagine you send it, the server sending the video, some of the data sent doesn't get to your browser. In that case, what happens? Well, maybe some of the pixels in the video are not displayed correctly in your browser. But if a few pixels out of 5 million pixels are not displayed correctly for a fraction of a second, then you usually don't notice that. So, and we'll see some more examples of this as we go through, through this lecture and even the course. With multimedia applications, accuracy doesn't have to be 100% sometimes. The data received doesn't have to be the same as what we send. What about delivery? Three measures, delivery, accuracy, timeliness. Delivery in both cases needs to be correct. Okay? Delivery is usually you have it or don't. We both, both cases need correct delivery. Let's move forward so we can get some examples. So our three effective measures of communication are quite general. Delivery, yes or no, we have it. 
But accuracy, how do we measure accuracy? How do we measure timeliness? And how do we measure other aspects of communication systems? We'll talk about performance metrics, ways to measure the performance of a communication system. So a metric, and we'll go through some example metrics, some common ones that you probably already know about. There are others, but we'll go through ones which I think most of you will know or have seen in some examples. We use metrics, so a metric is a way to measure the performance of a communication system. We'll look at different metrics. Why do we use them? How do we use them? Sometimes we want to measure the performance of real systems. We build a communication system. How does it perform? So we use metrics to, to compare, to see how it performs. Or sometimes I want to predict or estimate what the performance will be of a new system. So we use met metrics to do that. So you get a job and your job is to choose the communication system for your company for a particular purpose. You need to choose a technology and one way you'll do it is compare based upon some of these metrics. Other things will be cost and, and other factors. We represent the different metrics usually using different statistics. But let's come back to them as we, after we go through a few of the metrics themselves. I'm about to show you on the following slides some example metrics, but there are others. Some of the others we'll see during the later lectures. But let's go direct into the simpler ones. Data rate is a common thing that we will refer to and we'll see when you need to select a particular communication technology. I'll try and give a simple definition of these metrics. Maybe some other names which you may have heard of which mean the same thing or a similar thing and some examples. By data rate I mean the rate at which the data, the information, is delivered from one point to another. So it's a rate, think of a speed. Data we would normally measure in bits, bits or bytes. Okay. If I use bits you can easily convert to bytes, vice versa. So the data rate we'll use as a base unit is bits per second. How many bits per second can we get from one point to another? I didn't bring my land cards today, but those that were here in the last lecture, remember the old land cards? Uh, my land card in my old computer at least, and the ones that I had last week, could send the technology built into those land cards could send 100 million bits every second. So when you buy the land card, that's a, a characteristic of that hardware, that it transmits at a maximum speed of 100 million bits every second. Quite simply, the data rate we'd say is 100 megabits per second. Okay. So it's a measure of how fast our device can send our, our data, our bits. Can anyone remember or know the data rate if I send wirelessly from my laptop to the access point on the wall? No, or want to have a guess? Maybe check on your phone, it may even tell you the data rate when you connect to a Wi-Fi access point. Anyone know the t typical values? How fast can I send to that access point on the wall? What's the data rate? It's an old one if you can't see it. Is that the answer? No. Okay, Any, anyone want to make a guess? 100. 100 what? Megabytes per second. Uh, all right, my the typical speed that you get when you plug the LAN cable into your computer is either 100 megabits per second, or if you're lucky, 1,000 megabits per second. 
typical, okay, depending on where you are and how old your device is. Do you think Wi-Fi is slower or faster than wired LAN? Hands up for faster. Good, good. Hands up for slower. Wi-Fi is slower than wired. Generally, okay, that, that's not always true, but generally this, the similar uh, type or cost of technology, wireless is slower than wired. This oldish access point supports a data rate of a maximum 54 million bits per second. 54 megabits per second. My old wired LAN, 100 megabits per second. Wireless, 54, about half. But newer ones can support faster, up to several hundred megabits per second. Similar that newer LAN cards can support one gigabit per second, 1,000 megabits per second. They are the, what we call the data rate, the rate which we can send bits across a link normally. Anyone know of some other examples? Who has home internet in their dorm, not wireless, but ADSL or cable? Anyone? Anyone who's used it before? Has anyone used the internet before? Just, just check if people have hands they can put up. You sure? You've not used the internet? Okay, it'll be a hard subject. Okay, if maybe if you've used home ADSL, okay, or, you, or your parents or your friends have ADSL, ADSL is a technology for uh, commonly used for internet access inside homes where you use the telephone line. The data rates which the modem supports usually in the order of several megabits per second. The maximum around here is around 24 megabits per second. Uh, for example at home I have a plan that I pay I don't know 600 baht per month and the data rate which I can download is a maximum of 10 megabits per second. Okay. Upload may be different. Anyone have cable? Cable internet? And how fast? 10? Usually you, you pay for faster okay, as, as normal. You, but generally cable can go faster but you need to pay more. Um, any people from outside of Thailand here? Any maybe have different technologies or different speeds? How fast is home or, or internet in the dorm or in an apartment? Examples? 10, around 10 megabits per second? Yeah, okay, so in the order around the tens of, or few to tens of megabits per second. Okay. Let's look at some other examples of technologies that you may have come across. And I'll use a, where? I'll just grab some, or go to Wikipedia and I'll just grab a few examples of different technologies. This is the list of device bit rates. Another name, I would call it a data rate, but sometimes called a bit rate. Some of them you'll know of. Before we go to it, who uses internet on their phone? Okay. Not Wi-Fi, but what? 3G. How fast? 3G. 42 what? Megabits. Usually, not always the case, but usually data rates are measured in bits per second, not bytes. The B means bits. Uh, you buy a hard drive and it's usually measured in bytes. You buy an internet connection or you pay for it, it's usually the B means bits per second. Okay? Not always, but common. So some 3G or 3.5G wi wireless mobile phone data rates are in the order of 42 megabits per second. 14 megabits per second was an older one, but again you may pay. The, the faster the speed, the more you pay. Uh, let's find a few. This is a quite a large web page with many different examples. I'll just go to. If you can't see it, you can have a look in your own time. Just who did their homework? 
you've still got some time to do the homework. The homework is simple from last week. Visit the website, log in, and make sure you're aware of how to use the website, and even try one of the practice lessons there. The first practice lesson talks about bits, bytes, megabits, megabytes, giga, and so on. The different prefixes and different units that we come and commonly come across. And these numbers are an example. And just quickly see the, the lesson to get further explanation. But when I say mega, I mean one million as here. One followed by six zeros. Mega, one million. In some forms of computing, we use binary prefixes. For example, kilobyte is not 1,000, but 1,024. When you talk about hard disks and file sizes, often 1,024 is meant by kilo. But I will not use that in this course. It's much easier for me to calculate in terms of thousands, millions, and billions. Okay. To see that explained, see that, try the lesson. Let's go through. These are old ones. Uh, remember, old style modem? How fast? Dial up modem, the strange noise modem. Sorry, there's a lot of information here. I'll just select a few of them. The typical speeds, the normal speeds for the dial up modem, around 56 kilobits per second. Okay, if you had that dial up internet access, 56 kilobits per second, 56,000 bits per second. Some other ADSL2. There are different variations of ADSL for home internet access. ADSL, maximum speed, because it can be lower than this, 24,000 kilobits per second or 24 megabits per second. That's download when you download from, say, the internet to your home. Upload is limited to about three and a half megabits per second. So there's different speeds up and down. Uh, cable modem, if you have cable internet access, a common one around here is what's called DOCSIS version 2. 38 megabits per second down, 27 megabits per second up. There's, in fact, a DOCSIS version 3, which goes up to 160 megabits per second down. So DOCSIS, or cable modem, and ADSL are commonly used for home internet access, or business internet access. Many other technologies there. Let's just skip through to a few that we may, you may know. Mobile phones. Many different ones here. Edge. Maybe before 3G, you may have been using Edge which was the order of hundreds of kilobits per second internet access to your mobile phone. 3G, there are different technologies. Here's one. HSPA, 3.5G listed here, 14 megabits per second. Okay, so just some examples of data rates of different technologies. And there are extensions up to 42 megabits per second for, for 3G, sorry, control. And some of the later mobile phone internet technologies go up to 300 megabits per second. Okay. 4G or LTE is the sometimes the name. What about, for example, so they are the things that we may use. Mobile phones, home internet, Wi-Fi is listed here. We'll see it later, but we'll see some different ones. What about that companies may use to connect between offices, between cities? What about when we connect, say, from Bangkok to Singapore for, for international internet access? How fast, do you think? Let's see some examples. These are... Connecting between cities or between countries, sometimes we refer to as wide area networks. A network across a wide area. The older technologies were in the order of one, two megabits per second. Still around some of them. We go down. OC means optical carrier, which is referring to optical fiber and the different 
standards of optical fiber. Common ones, OC192, 10 gigabits per second. Okay, so international links commonly using optical fiber in the order of tens of gigab 10 gigabits per second. And up to maybe 160 gigabits per second for latest technologies. That's enough for them. Uh, what lands inside an office or a home, where do we get to? And down the bottom, I hope, wireless lands. This wireless access point is 802.11G, 54 megabits per second. But newer ones go up to 11N, 600 megabits per second. And the latest technology released is AC, up to 7 gigabits per second, under, under very special conditions. Have a look through there just to get some examples of different data rates. Sometimes called bit rate, the rate at which bits are sent across a link. Capacity, that is how much, what's the maximum we can send across a link? What's the capacity of the link? And we'll see a few others that may come up in the later lectures. N similar names for data rate. Delay, another metric. This comes back to our timeliness measure. The time it takes to get data from one point to another. Also called latency. The latency is equivalent to delay. Delay we usually mean to get from one point to another, but sometimes we're interested in to get from one point to another and then back. Okay, to get there and back. To get there and back is called the response time or sometimes the round trip time. Response time. Send a request, get a response. What's the total delay? Round trip time. Time to get there and back. Make a trip all the way around. Measured in seconds. Two quick examples. I send an email at 10 a.m. Press send. It arrives at the destination at 10.03. The delay is three minutes. The email delay is three minutes. I'm web browsing. I click on a link at time 1.4 seconds. Okay, if I start the clock then. And at time 2.6 seconds, so 1.2 seconds later, I receive the web page displayed on my web on my browser. Then we'd say the response time is 1.2 seconds. Because we covered in the first lecture, web browsing is you send a request to a server for a web page, the server sends back a reply, a response. So how long does it take from when you send the request until you get the response? That's the response time. In this case, I send the request at time 1.4. I get the response at time 2.6. So the response time is 1.2 seconds, the difference between the two. Has anyone... Uh, come across delay, latency, or response time, or round trip time in any other applications? Has anyone ever played an online game? Maybe a multiplayer game? You may have heard of ping time. The time, it's some measure used to, to measure how good the network is to play that game. Because again, you want a quick response time. The ping time is really a measure of round trip time time to get to some destination and back, maybe to a server and back. We will look at some more detail of how, how do you calculate delay or what contributes to delay. There's a few slides later for that one. What else? Uh, error rate something you may not have seen so much, but are now a measure of accuracy. Our two general measures of uh, timeliness and accuracy. Timeliness, we can measure by delay. Accuracy, by error rate sometimes. 
I send data from A to B. B doesn't receive all of the data. How much didn't it receive? Well, we can talk about well the data not received, th that means it's an error. It wasn't delivered. What rate of errors do we have out of the total being sent? So error rate I'll define as the fraction of data sent that doesn't get delivered to the destination. We want it to be low. Sometimes it's the bit error rate. I send a thousand bits across a link. On average, 23 bits arrive, but they don't, they're in error. What, it, what does it mean if a bit is in error? I transmit a bit one. I transmit a bit one. It arrives at the destination as a bit zero. That's a bit error. Okay. When I transmit a bit one, when it arrives at the destination, the destination should interpret it as a one. That's successful delivery. If it arrives as the opposite bit, then it's an error. So if, for example, I have a link where I send a thousand bits and on average 23 of those bits arrive in error, they arrive, but they are wrong, then we could say the bit error rate is 23 divided by 1,000. 23 out of 1,000, or 2.3 percent, or as a fraction, 0. Point, or decimal, 0 0.023. There are no units here. It's a ratio. Or, more generally, I send an email to all 100 students in a group. Something goes wrong, five students don't receive the email. I can say there's an error rate of 0 0.05, five out of 100, or five percent. We'd like the error rate, generally, to be low. Okay, we're getting into some newer ones here that you may not have come across, but I think not too hard to understand. Actually, before we go, let's go back a step and look at some examples of delay. How do we measure delay in a computer network? Has anyone measured the delay before? How? play a game and then specifically in, in that game what's the term or what's the thing that measures the delay? Lag is sometimes used. Another name you may see is ping. Okay, Ping refers to actually an application. The concept of pinging something is, at least in computer networking, is send a message to see if it's there and that entity will tell you it's there by sending a response. If you get a response, you know that you can communicate with that entity. But in terms of delay, ping is we send a message to some destination. The destination, when it gets that message, sends back a response. The time from when you send the message until you get the response is called the ping time or the response time or round trip time. I have a program called ping on my computer. We can test the round trip time for different locations. Let me get this correct. Let me just set up and make sure we have our network working. Slow, it's okay. Be patient. I have my computer and I'm going to use the ping application just to test the delay or the response time from one location to another. 
to do this demo, I'm going to use my computer in Japan. Okay? Uh, it doesn't work inside SIT. Okay? The SIT network does not, a, do not, does not allow us to do the things that I'm about to do. So I'm actually remotely connected to my computer in Japan and we'll do it from there. So everything I do, imagine we're sitting in Japan at the moment. We'll use ping to test the delay between my computer in Japan to other computers in the world. Don't worry about the commands I'm typing, it's not so important. But I'm going to ping the Google web page in Japan. A lot of information shown, I'll just highlight what we care about. What happened? I pinged from my computer in Japan to the Google website in Japan. The idea was to send a message to the Google web server and that would send back a response. And I did it five times, a count of five. Send first message, get a response. And the first response Focus, ignore that most of this, focus on time. The time from when I sent the request until I received the response was 2.13 milliseconds. That's called the ping time, the round trip time, or the response time. It's the time to get there and back. And then my application sent a second request and got a second response. The time was 1.8 milliseconds. And then the other three requests and responses, because I specified to do just five, the count of five. And it gives us some summary statistics, the round trip time, RTT, minimum, average, maximum, and the mean deviation. The average, 1.865 milliseconds. Roughly, it's about close to two milliseconds from my computer in Japan to the Google web server in Japan doesn't matter about the command or all these details, just take note of the time. Let's try a different one, a different destination. From Japan to the SIT web server. Anyone want to estimate what the time will be? Seven hours? Seven seconds? Seven milliseconds? Let's find out. About 115, 120 milliseconds. Okay. So my computer's in Tokyo. SIT web server's in Bangkok. So what's happening? My computer sends a message to Tokyo to Bangkok. Takes about 60 milliseconds. 60 milliseconds to get there. And then the server responds, about another 60 milliseconds to get back, I estimate, meaning a total of about 120 milliseconds. Remember, this is the round trip time. The one-way delay was probably about half of that. Okay? About 120 milliseconds. Why is it much, much larger? Japan to Google Japan, 2 milliseconds. Japan to Bangkok, 120 milliseconds. Why? It's further away. So? We will do calculations later and see how we could calculate delay in, in ideal conditions. And people are right in it's further away. One aspect of that is the signal that represents the information must travel a larger distance. Remember how fast a signal travels? A signal like light travels at the speed of light. The further it needs to travel, the longer the time it will take. So one aspect of the delay is how far physically it must travel. Okay, the physical distance. But there are many other aspects as well, like the speeds of the links, like the speeds of the computers. Uh, one or two more. Japan to uh, the UK. OK, 
Okay, so here from Japan to the UK, I don't know which direction it takes across the world. Does it go across the Pacific, across the US, or does it go west across Asia? I don't know, but it takes about 240 milliseconds in that case. Much larger distance. But there may be other factors in play. You can test this maybe from a computer at home using ping. It works in Windows, it works on a Mac. It doesn't work so well inside SIT, but at home it will. Any questions? Questions so far? How's time going? 30 minutes. Everything okay? First lecture? Okay, good. Uh, do I have an example of error rate? No, not yet. Overhead. In many cases, we introduced in the first lecture, we use protocols to communicate. Protocols define how we send our messages. In many cases, to work correctly, we can't just send the original data as is. We need to send some extra information to make it work correctly. It's it's hopefully he's successful here. <laughs> Good. Everyone's comfortable for the last thirty minutes. <laughs> we survive anyway. <laughs> Overhead. The amount of additional data needed in order to deliver useful data. Now we're going to distinguish between two types of data. I want to get, I want to get a, uh, what's an example? I want to get an, I want to download a file. Okay, the file is one megabyte. So the file is on some server, and I want to get that one megabyte to my computer. We mentioned in the last lecture, we don't just send the file as one large piece of data, one large megabyte. We may break it into smaller chunks, into packets, and send them one at a time. And the protocols involved in doing that, every time they send part of that one megabyte, they may add some, add some extra information to keep track of those chunks. Let's say I split those 1, 000, 1 million bytes into 1,000 packets. 1,000 chunks. Then when I send a chunk, or the server sends a chunk, it would include extra information identifying that this is chunk one, this is chunk two, chunk three, and so on. It may include a sequence number in there. What else may be included? Every time we send a message, the message may include the address of the destination. Last lecture we mentioned addresses like URLs, IP addresses. To make sure we get effective delivery to the correct destination, when we send our data, the message may contain the destination address. So, it's very common that we send some additional data with the, the real data we want to deliver. The real data is that one megabyte file, but I attach some other information. Overhead is how much other information. So it's a measure of what extra do we need to make this work, but is not the real useful data. Bit hard to give too many examples yet until we get into some real protocols later, but a couple here. It's measured in bits, so the overhead, how many extra bits do we have to send? Some of you know about parity checks, maybe in computer hardware error detection schemes. For every 8 bits of data that I have, I may add a 2-bit parity check to make sure that someone who gets that data can detect if there are any errors in that data. It's used in computer hardware or in uh, file systems to keep track of files, for example. 
So there's eight bits of real data plus an extra two bits to make sure that the data is delivered correctly. We say those extra two bits are the overhead. Another example, I send a chunk of data as a packet containing 1,000 bytes of real data and 50 bytes of additional data, often referred to as a header. It's usually added at the start, at the head of the real data. The overhead is quite simply the extra additional data of 50 bytes. So it's the extra stuff we need to send to get the real data to the destination. Why do we need it? Well, we'll see many different cases to include addresses, to include sequence numbers, to do error detection if something goes wrong for the receiver to be able to detect if there's errors. We'll see those through the course. Let's get to one more and then to through, well, throughput. Here we are. Data rate. The rate at which the data is delivered from one point to another. For example, the data rate that I can send bits from my laptop to the access point is 54 million bits per second. Throughput is the rate at which useful data is delivered to the destination. Let's go direct to some examples to explain. Uh, I think you may know when you download a file from a website and the browser gives some feedback about the bits per second or the time it takes, it may go up and down. The, s the download speed may vary over time. And it's usually much lower than you expect or you hope. Because often we know about the data rate. The data rate of Wi-Fi is 54 megabits per second. Of your mobile phone, four, 14 megabits per second. Of your home internet, 24 megabits per second. That's the data rate, the rate at which we can send bits. But there are overheads that always occur. Plus there are things that may go wrong. So another measure of performance is what's called throughput. It's the rate at which the real useful data gets delivered. And it's less than the data rate. Uh, let's see if we can get an example. I'm going to download I'm going to download a file from my computer, not in Japan anymore, but back to here, from my computer from where? From the ICT web server. Okay, our course website is on the ict.sittuact.th. Where is that web server? Anyone know? It's a computer somewhere. Where is it? ICT. Third floor of this building. Okay, it, it's downstairs, a few few floors. There's just a PC sitting in there. That's the ICT web server. Let's download a file from it and see how fast it takes to download. Uh, I've put a file there that I can copy, I think. So wget is just a program that will download the file for me. The web, the address, ICT web server domain, and the file I created before is just some random data. Okay, it means nothing. See if it works. It's downloading. The file was 10 megabytes. And this software downloads the file. It was 10 megabytes, the file. And it gives us what? Some summary, maybe here, 2.36 megabytes per second. That's the throughput. It is a measure of, or well, maybe here there's maybe some approximations or some different calculations going on here. That the timer is not that accurate. 10 megabytes in 4.0 seconds equates to 10 million bytes divided by 4.0 seconds, 2.43 million bytes per second. Okay, that's the calculation of throughput. The real data is the file. The real useful data is the 10 megabytes. 
The time it takes is 4 seconds, so the throughput is simply 10 megabytes divided by 4 seconds, or 2.43 megabytes per second, million bytes per second. Let's download again. Same file. Faster. The throughput in this case, it took 2.2 seconds. Why? Same location, the server's still downstairs, same file, same size. Why? I don't know the exact answer why. But note that it varies. The throughput may vary under, at different times. The reason why in this case most likely is because in a computer network, the speed depends not just upon you downloading, but what others may be doing at the same time. Someone else may, may have been downloading a file at the same time as the first case. Therefore, mine had to wait a little bit. It was slower. Whereas in the second instance, maybe no one else was downloading from the ICT web server, and therefore mine was much faster. I don't know unless I analyze that in depth. But the throughput, first, is the rate at which the real data is delivered. It may vary over time, and in fact is hard to predict. How many megabits per second, approximately, of the faster one? Megabits per second? Easy one. How many megabits per second? Approximately. 35? Okay. So, 4 times 8. This is, note that uppercase B means bytes. Lowercase B normally bits. So, this is... 4.4 megabytes per second times by 8, so around 35 megabits per second. I'm using my wired LAN, okay? I downloaded via the wired LAN. Let's see if I can, I'm going to unplug, unplug and if I can, and switch to Wi Fi. Let's hope this works. Now I'm downloading and I'm using the wireless link. Same file, 10 megabytes took 7 seconds, 7.1 seconds. 1.45 megabytes per second. Why is it slower? Why is it slower? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, good. Uh, most likely. Again, we, c we cannot know for sure. Okay, but I guess that when I was using the wired link, the maximum speed I could send was 100 megabits per second. That's from here to the next device. And then there's another device, another link to go via. When I'm using Wi-Fi, the maximum I can send to this wireless access point here is 54 megabits per second. But I know that there are many overheads involved. Using Wi-Fi, even though the data rate is 54 megabits per second, the overheads practically mean the best you can get is about half of that. And later we'll do some calculations as to why, but with wireless, best you'll get about half. And even worse, if many people are on their phones using the same Wi-Fi access point at the same time, my throughput will be even lower. Okay, so it depends upon what others are doing. So I guess that the reason this is slower is because the, of the wireless access. If I plug the wired LAN back in, it would go up again. Uh, let me go back to wired and do two more examples. Sometimes these don't work as I planned, but we'll try. Downloading a different file from Kazakhstan University, so also in Thailand. 
So this is from KU, Kazakhstan, so the other side of Bangkok. About three megabytes per second. So this is before it was to a server downstairs. Now it's to a server on the other side of Bangkok, okay, 20, 30 kilometers away. Uh, about 3.6 megabytes per second. Doesn't matter what the file is, but I know that there's the same file on other servers in the world. I'll download the same file from somewhere else. Uh, this one's in Singapore. Same file. Let's hope it connects. There we go. So this is from us to Singapore. Or Singapore sending the file to, to here in Bangkok, in fact. So you'll see it's, it's going down. It's around, so OK. It goes up and down, up and down. Okay. Many different factors impact on it. Here we averaged about one and a half before we got three and a half, more than three and a half megabytes per second. Last one. Same file, but in Australia. Uh, ETA, three minutes. Okay, we may not wait till the end. Why? Why is it different? Ping. Okay, so one, what's the difference? So we had Bangkok to Bangkok, Bangkok to Singapore, Bangkok to Australia, actually the opposite direction. Why is it, what's different? I think most people can recognize the physical distance is different. The delay may be different. But in many cases, the delay doesn't matter. The time to download a file, once you get started, once the download starts, doesn't depend much upon the delay or the, the distance. It depends upon other factors, many other factors. What's one of them? This one's still going. Okay. What, what could be another factor that impacts upon the throughput? Anyone? Okay, if other people are accessing, say, the server at the same time, the server needs to respond. Okay, so in many compu communication systems, the, the, the number of users using it at the same time means the system slows down. What else? Think about all of the links between my computer and the server. The first link using white wired access is this cable going from my computer into the wall it goes up I'm pretty sure it goes direct into a device in the third floor and then that device has a cable direct into the server there are just two links between me and the server oh sorry this was the server in Kazakhstan so there's another link there's more links inside Thailand whereas going to Australia the links are inside Thailand and then probably Australia down to Singapore and then most likely a submarine cable Singapore down to, to Sydney or somewhere. Okay, there are multiple links and then inside Australia to the destination. The speed of those links may have a large impact upon the throughput. The data rate of those links. Generally, if you have a sequence of links that you must use, your limit is the minimum of the data rates of all of those links sometimes called the bottleneck link. If my data passes through three links, one is one megabit per second, the second is 10 megabits per second, and the third is 50 megabits per second, the best that I can get is limited by one megabit per second link. So the set of links and what are their data rates will impact upon my throughput. Today we're just introducing these concepts. Over uh, a, a few of the lectures, we'll see some more calculations of how to how to calculate throughput and some more details of what would impact upon throughput. Did we get to the end?
in a few seconds, yes. So, like the examples I just illustrated, if I was downloading a 12 megabyte file from a website and it took 26 seconds, calculate the throughput. How? <laughs> throughput is the rate at which useful data, in this case the file, is delivered to the destination. And here we'd really talk about the average throughput. On average, if we take 26 seconds to send 12 megabytes, on average we're sending or receiving at 6 million bits per second. How? Just file size divided by time. Uh, we don't need that anymore. What do we have? 26. Our file was 12 megabytes, which is, let's convert to bits. Uh, times by 8 is 96 megabits, or 96 million bits. That's how much real or useful data we have to deliver. It took, what do we say, 26 seconds to download. So we can say the throughput, the rate at which that useful data was delivered, we're delivering 96 million bits in 26 seconds. Which is whatever it was on our lecture slide. What was it? 6 megabits per second approximately. Is that right? I don't think that's right, is it? It doesn't sound right. What did I do wrong? 3.6 megabits per second. Good. 96 divided by 26 is 3.5 or 3.6, correct? Why does my lecture notes say 6? <laughs> because I made a mistake somewhere. You can be better than me and use a calculator. About 3.6 megabits per second. Fix your lecture notes. So it's just the total size, the, the total number of useful bits divided by the time it takes to deliver them. The rate. This one's easy to calculate. If we know the total size and know the time, it's just this division. But in many cases, in some networks, we may not know uh, how long it takes. We need to estimate what the throughput would be in advance. So we need to look at overhead. But let's stick with this simple one for today. Any questions on this calculation? Fix your lecture notes, fix my error in there. 3.6, not 6. We'll come back to a, some other calculations later about uh, throughput. Do we have anything to finish? Efficiency. Efficiency is related to throughput and overhead. In general, the fraction of time we spend using a, a resource for its intended purpose. Come direct to this example. Let's say my Wi-Fi link has a data rate of 54 megabits per second. I know that. When I buy the laptop and the access point, the specifications say 54 megabits per second. 
And when I, uh, usually I can select and see, I don't know if it does this, connection information. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm on my wired link. Uh, WSIT and I'll get there. I can unplug. Speed is at 2 megabits per second, 5 megabits per second for my Wi Fi. Up to 11 megabits per second. The maximum it will go to is 54 here. It's not going to go there for me today because it changes depending upon the signal, maybe, and how strong the signal is for my laptop. But if we have a data rate of 54 megabits per second, but I download a file and I measure the throughput to be 20 megabits per second, then I could say the efficiency in that case of using the link is 0.37. 20 divided by 54. You check if I've got that calculation correct. My data rate is the maximum speed at which I can send bits. The throughput is the true speed at which I deliver real data. So the efficiency is, well, what fraction of that maximum speed do I utilize? 20 out of 54, 37%. So in that case, I'd say the efficiency of the link usage is 37%. We'd like that to be as high as possible. So this is just 20 divided by 54. Another example, let's say I pay a thousand baht per month for my 10 megabit per second home internet access. On average, every month, I download at 2 megabits per second. Well, I'm 20% efficient. I only use that resource on average 20% of the time. We will use efficiency to compare different systems and to compare different protocols. I think we'll stop there. Next lecture, when tomorrow, we'll look at I'll try and find a few more examples of those metrics and then we'll look at delay, come back to delay in a bit more depth, do some more calculations.